The future of work and technology space. We are at the era where the discussions around the future of work and technology space can no longer be kept at the base of our priority. Fourth industrial revolution is here, and this is hitting the world with the ongoing pandemic. People are now being forced to start thinking about a new approach to work and business. In this video I bring to you great insight and views from experts. Gerd Leonard a leading futurist, humanist, and a great author. Mark Zuckerberg. An internet entrepreneur and philanthropist, generally known for co-founding Facebook, Inc. Yuval Noah Harari. A great historian and philosopher who has written many best-selling titles. This is a video you cannot afford to miss. Remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for more amazing videos. Yes, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. What a beautiful place. I don't want to leave. You know, well, you know, I live in Switzerland, which is not bad either. <laughs> well, so um, I lived in the US for 17 years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was born in Germany. I live in Switzerland now, so I feel very like tri-national, you could say. So when I talk about the US later, it's keep in mind with my green card. Uh, my comments on, on the U.S. economy and politics and so on. I have a few uh, comments on society and, and technology. You know, the last few years when I, uh, when I spoke around the world, I get this constant question from people, A, is the future going to be as terrible as it looks? Because okay. a lot of people are worried about the future now. I think you can feel that, uh, not, not just because of the, you know, the U.S. elections, but before that even. Uh, one major factor is that people are thinking that machines will sort of, you know, run everything, uh, reduce our jobs. Uh, and my view on that is, you know, the future is better than we think. Because we tend to look at technology and get worried when we watch, you know, X machine or uh, those kind of, you know. But, of course, they're pretty far away from reality. <laughs> so the book has a provocative title. I actually think it's going to be humanity on top of technology. And judging from what we discussed yesterday, that's kind of the consensus in the room. It's very important to keep that in mind because, you know, basically in 10 years, technology will be infinitely powerful. Uh, if you've, I'm sure you've observed the uh, exponential scale, which I'll show you shortly. But basically, roughly in 10 years, machines can do pretty much anything. You know, quantum computer, computing, uh, the possibility of really constant networks, the Internet of Things. Uh, so it's pretty safe to say, you know, what people call the singularity. Roughly in 10, 15 years or so, we're going to get to that point to where computers and machines are capable, uh, beyond our means. And so really what it means, you know, when we're looking at devices that we have today, these devices here are already our external brain, right? They're our second brain. So we keep in here our banking now, you know, talking about Bitcoin, blockchain, that's, that's a few years away <laughs> in the cloud. Right? Our music, our films, our dates, if you're so inclined. I mean, if we forget the phone numbers of people because they're in here, right? And very soon, this machine will be a million times as powerful. I mean, this, this machine right here is as powerful as the mainframe computer that brought us to the moon right? in terms of processing power. So imagine we can connect that directly with the brain-computer interface or augmented reality, virtual reality, we would be essentially tethered to this. Right? So this is my job. My job is not to predict, it's to observe. And I would maintain if you're the C-level executive, CIO, CTO, CEO, that's going to be a big part of your job, right? is to observe what is coming. This has very little to do with Nostradamus or Alvin Toffler or Ray Kurzweil or Arthur C. Clarke. It is just a skill to observe what is coming before it's here. And this is crucial now because, you know, things are coming much faster than ever before. The German car industry is a great example. You know, years ago, seven years ago, we had a seminar with a bunch of CEOs of a big German car group. And we're sitting in the room talking about self-driving cars, autonomous cars, car sharing, which is a no-no in Germany. Uh, we don't share our cars, right? Uh, at least we don't. Uh, and in those days, it was seven years ago, we had laughter in the room, talking about electric cars, autonomous cars, car sharing, you know? it was just laughter. Ludicrous ideas. 
Today, the number one initiative of every car company in Germany is to go towards mobility, not selling cars. It took only seven years. So seeing that coming is important, hence uh, I'd like to say sometimes it's better if we assume less and we discover more. Very common problem with my clients, I do a lot of CEO coaching, is that they're always looking on the left side into the same funnel that has proven to make money, which is natural, of course. Right? But we have to have a larger view. We have to look at what becomes possible because of technology, what works because of technology, and what will stop working because of technology. So hence the book, and I think you'll see in the book some of the chapters about what I call the mega shifts and other things. So this curve you've seen many times before, the exponential curve, it's an old hat. And Moore's law is kind of ending for computing. Some people would argue. But the bottom line is, you know, we're now at the takeoff point of this curve. We're at the uh, curve where things that sounded like science fiction are actually becoming science fact. Computers will understand language, natural language processing. That's pretty close to perfect. They can read images. They can translate text. Artificial intelligence is uh, enabling machines to, you know, parenthesis, think. I'll talk about that in a second. So we're getting to the point where some of the stuff that we saw in science fiction movies, uh, you know, like Tom Cruise going inside of Minority Report, the data, that's actually possible now. And the interesting part is that it's not just one thing. It's also what I call combinatorial, which means that all the stuff that goes on in like 50 areas from 3D printing uh, to cloud computing to quantum machines, they're all influencing each other. So it's exponential and combinatorial and interdependent. And that's how we shape our businesses now. I mean, if it wasn't for exponential and combinatorial, there would be no Uber, no Airbnb. There would be no, none of the things that didn't work because it didn't work. I started a company like Spotify. You know, I used to be in the music business. I was a producer and musician. And I started a company like Spotify in 2003. And you know, needless to say, it wasn't working because there was no real cloud to stream from. You know? There was no iPhone. You know? So we spent $20 million trying to find out how we can overcome this. Right? And a few years later, then Daniel Eck came up and used the theme of my first book, Music Like Water, uh, to build Spotify. And uh, you know, Spotify has almost 100 million paying subscribers today. Right? So uh, when, the, when the circumstance is right, then it just takes off and it's just completely natural. But you know, the bottom line is now we're, we're going towards a time to where we are increasingly converging with technology. And you know, we've come to the wearable computing. Uh, that's, most people are not so crazy about this. You know, like I don't really like an Apple Watch. I'm already way too busy with a mobile. So uh, Apple Watch doesn't really do it for me. But the idea of connecting your brain to the internet what's called the neural lace, you know, Elon Musk. Where do we stop? So I have one simple question for you. Is this going to make us happy? Are we going to be happy when we connect to the internet directly? When we are transcending humanity, as, as uh, some people would ironically say. Right? And what is happiness? Well, that's hard to define in one morning, right? But read the book, it's all in the book. <laughs> But yeah, humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. And that's not an overstatement. The kids of my kids will live to be an average of 100 years old. They will not know how to drive a real car. They'll just command it. They probably won't know what a book is. Definitely not what a CD or a DVD is. I mean, it's already basically true today if you give your kids a CD for Christmas or DVD, they'll call a therapist. <laughs> As you know, like hopelessly yesterday, you know. Vinyl, that's different, you know, that's cool, but. So we're entering this world. Right? I wouldn't say necessarily the world of science fiction, but this is now almost a reality, right? You know, and every policeman wants to have a 3D, you know, a, uh, an Oculus Rift or, or a HoloLens, you know, to see who we are when they pull us over. Every doctor wants this, every politician wants it, you know, so they can uh, you know, better tap into our funds, I suppose. But now we're going into a world where we are essentially you know, getting unlimited power. Right? <laughs> right? 
I mean, it's a weird thing is that, you know, imagine if, for example, uh, imagine, for example, if, um, if a doctor has a computer, cognitive machine that is able to read all the 4,300 oncology reports a week, the doctor is superhuman. Or the doctor would feel threatened, right? Because the machine is kind of like a human. But technology makes us superhuman. The work of a thousand people can now be done by one. Not always, but we're getting there, right? I mean, right today, machines are still pretty stupid, right? They, they can do some things well and other ones not at all. But you can see where this is going. We're teaching the machines how to do this. That's five, seven, ten years. I mean, cognitive computing will not work without teaching, right? So we have to take our time teaching the machines. But the bottom line is, you know, we're moving into a world of cognitive systems. Not everywhere, but quite clearly machines will no longer be primarily programmed. They will apply deep learning and learn what we missed. I mean, a doctor can't possibly, you know, read all that stuff about the latest things. A computer can read a million books a minute. But if the computer reads a million books a minute and I feed the computer the whole library of philosophy, would the computer be a philosopher? Well, the answer is obviously not. He would know a lot of things about, or she in most cases, right, would know a lot of things about what's in the books, but would, would they actually comprehend the meaning of it? Would they make the connection? Unlikely. And I would argue it's not needed. It's plenty if the computer has all the data and they can give us zeros and ones as an output because we can do so much with that. We don't need the computer to be sentient, right, to, to actually understand us. So I'll give you some examples. I think you know, we're moving into a world where machines can hear us, they can see us, they can understand us, they are taught. You know, we're only a year, 18 months away from 100% of natural language understanding. You know what that means is that it's, it's game over with inputting with the keyboard or downloading an app. We just say, hey, you know, I want to get married. Give me a suggestion. I need to invest $10,000, you know, eco-friendly investment. Boom, done. That's just around the corner. Imagine how that will change customer service. You know, if the airport closes in Chicago, no more phone calls. You go to your bot and say, hey, book, rebook me. Done. Because the bot knows about everything about you. So that's all very close. And I would say, sometimes I say, you know, we're living in a world where everything that used to be dumb, you know, home, city, energy, transport, is getting smart. We sometimes jokingly call this a smart converter. Um, there's some statistics say it's roughly a $60 trillion business is to make the dumb thing smart. And you're all in that business, so you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, this is huge. But we should stop at a certain point because not everything should be smart. Not everything should be connected or automated. There are some limits to how good that would be. I mean, basically, what I call the cognification of network machines is a bigger change in the industrial society. I mean, it's fairly trivial with autonomous cars that ride around cities, right? But think about things like lawyers, judges, based on software. Right? That already exists. Again, sounds like science fiction, but we're getting very close, right? In Florida, the first trials of a software that can predict if a person is going to do, commit a crime again or if they should go out on probation or not. And that is a judge's job, usually. Right? So I don't know who makes the software, because the, their argument would be that the judge may have had a bad day or be tired or you know, feel grumpy or, or you know, have a bias. The machine wouldn't. Now we have to ask the question, well, that's very practical, right? but is it human? Wouldn't it be better if the judge actually used the stuff from the machine right, to become a super judge and be faster, right, but still make his own decision? And would that be practical? You know, it could be the same problem that we have with airlines, with pilots. Uh, the biggest problem is the handover problem. Your computer says, I'm done. I can't go any further. Take over. And the pilot has 0 .4, 0 0.4 seconds to decide. Humanly impossible. 
So that's all the kind of things that we're going to go into this future. And basically what's happening is every digital company, every internet company, every uh, company that works with data is working on this, the global brain. Uh, in fact, Google has a project called the global, global brain. Right? I looked the other day, there's like 25 brain projects. Every data, everywhere, everyone. And so soon the question will no longer be if technology can do something, because they, the answer will be yes. You know, today we're sitting here and saying, oh, it's going to be too expensive, maybe it doesn't work. You know, how much do we have to redo our IT systems and so on, and, you know, everyday problems. But in the future, not too far away, five, seven, eight years, technology can do it. The answer is always going to be yes. Because, you know, the curve is like this. So the key question will not be if we can do something, because if, if, you know, we just can. The question will be why. What is the purpose of what we're doing? Is the purpose to cut people out of the loop, you know, increase our margins, invent a new business model, compete? Or is it prevention of other people's business models? Yeah. Does it serve human purpose? I mean, that is the ultimate question. Yeah. I mean, in business, we're in business to make our clients happy. And as I said, you know, happiness is not so easy to define. We know that they're very unhappy with bad tech. But does good tech make them happy? Well, yes, to some degree. But on the other side, you know, what really makes them happy is things like this. Right? Relationships. I mean, this is the human element. Relationships, trust, emotions, uh, the human things. So when we look at things like the Internet of Things that we're building, we're essentially building a new meta-intelligence. We're building a brain. As Cisco says, 700 billion devices in, in roughly seven years. Everything. I mean, the power of that is mind-boggling. Superpower. 90% positive, but who's going to be accountable for this? Or is it going to be like Facebook? Right? It says, oh, no, no, we, we, we don't have control what people do here. You know? They just pay $75 million and they can do whatever they like. That's probably not a good idea. I think that's fine when you're in the advertising business. You know, you, you get beaten up over that. But you know, if we build a system where everything is connected, our food, our banking, our digital money, our cities, our houses, our health records, we can't just say, well, you know, we just make the tech and let other people worry about the consequences. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I would ask about this. You know, if you're in that business, what are your ethics? Can I hold you accountable? Are you reliable? I don't know if you noticed, but you know, there's a major trust crisis uh, towards Silicon Valley now. Because, not because they're bad, it's because they're too good. Right? It's amazing the stuff, and it's hard to follow you know, who you should trust and which way we're going with this. So on this scale, basically, this is our challenge, right? We are linear. Unless you believe that you're going to become a machine and you know, increase memory space in your brain, which some people want to do, or you know, if you eat lots of what's called nootropics, you, know, you may have heard about that, you know, the little performance pills, the Viagra for the mind. Um, you know, we are just linear. We're not going to be like machines. And in a very short time, machines will go way, you know, 30 times in the exponential curve is a billion. 30 times is a billion. So that's what's where we're at, right? And so what we need to do is we need to figure out, you know, we, we're not going to go back on technology. That's not going to happen. We keep inventing. And after all, it's us who invent it, right? But we're going to have to catch up with our rules and ethics and society. Right? So the definition of ethics really is the difference between what you have a right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. I mean, look no further than Washington just the last couple of days, right? That's exactly what this whole debate is about. They have the right to do whatever they want and make money any which way they want, but is, is it the right thing to do? I mean, that is the key question. 
and it transcends the business model and you know, mere thinking of profit. So you know, technology really is what I call hell then. You know? Hell and heaven. That is also not new. I mean, every technology is like the television is hell then, right? 6.5 hours a day, the average American watches television. Right? 6.5 hours. It's hard to believe because I don't, but I'm not American, I guess. But So, I mean, technology is mind-boggling. I mean, think about genomic editing of, of the human gene, right? DNA editing, what's called programming the human body, right? reprogramming. If that works, well, that could be fantastic. We can solve cancer. But we'll have super soldiers. How about that? Well, that's probably not such a good consequence. So we can make you know, nice things that can be used as a tool, like social networks, that kind of like social bombs. Or we can actually use that for warfare. Right? Quantum computing, AI, virtuality, genome editing. And so how do we keep one from the other? I mean, this is obviously the, the ongoing battle, I think, in technology. Who is ultimately going to be what I call mission control for humanity? Who decides? Is mission control for humanity just a question of profit? Well, it can't possibly be. Because if it was for profit, you know, we would do whatever makes money, and that would be the end of the, of the road for us. You know, AI, genome editing, geoengineering. So how are we cautious but don't you know, stifle innovation? That's a major challenge for us. So in this world, as machines are getting smart, lots of opinions have been voiced about what happens with that. You know. But some people say it's going to be game over for humans. Like Stephen Hawkins just yesterday said that, again, Hawking, yeah, who I admire, but I don't quite agree with that. I think uh, Elon Musk has said several times, you know, we need some sort of regulatory oversight at the international level to make sure we don't do something foolish. I tend to agree with that, but I would also boil it down to more of a simple headline. I think the most promising future is one where we don't postpone innovation, but we also don't dismiss the exponential, exponential risk as somebody else's business. In other words, we just keep inventing, and we say, well, if somebody abusing us, let, let the FBI worry about it. Yeah. Or somebody else is going to fix it. So now you see all tech companies that are inventing in the space of IoT and AI to also think about the unintended consequences, what's called the externalities. Right? I mean, imagine if we hadn't curbed the, the zealous uh, oil companies, we'd have drilling towers right here. Right? That's called an externality. <laughs> we don't want this with AI. You know, we want to be careful about where we're going without preventing it. So, the key question really is, what's going to happen with humans and machines? Okay? We are going to this future. We are already here. All of you are glued to your mobile phones whenever you can. So am I. Okay. But it's still a bit like you know, it's outside of us. Imagine when that moves really inside of us and we can connect directly. There's already sort of a... Uh, a tag in the U.S. that's being used to describe the future of work, which is wired or fired. Right? So you're either always there or you're not there at all. Right? Uh, that is your, your choice. So is the future going to be like this? I always like to say that you know, I'd, I'd like to be smarter. I think that's a good idea. But really, in the end, I would prefer to be more human. I think that's being smarter is an end is a is a game I will lose. You know, I was the other day at a, at one of the big providers of AI uh, based machines, and I asked the machine what the future of Europe was, and she gave me a ten minute talk about the future of Europe. I'm like, that's my job, you damn machine. <laughs> huh? Well, I realized it's actually not really my job. You know? My job is to go beyond what the machine can pull together in information. You know, information is a commodity. We're reaching the end of the knowledge economy where we know more than our clients. Well, that's not going to last, right? Because <laughs> the client can just speak to a machine. Uh, machines are dumb now, but give it five years and they will figure this out. Yeah. So we may be the last generation of unaugmented humans. The last people that know what offline actually means. When we talk to Gen X, you know, 20-year-olds, the other day I was in, in Zanzibar, 
with my younger son, and we were on the beach and, and uh, enjoying the sunset, and, and he pulls out his mobile and he hits the button and nothing happens, and he hits it. He says, what's wrong with my music? Well, the answer was, no internet. He had never in his life been anywhere where the button didn't work. So that is like breathing. But should we be like this as a result, right? Should we, I don't think that's a very good destination for us, you know, to connect directly to become superhuman. So here's the key question that will keep you off for a few days. How computable are we? Let's believe it or not, the belief in technology in many places is so strong that a lot of people are arguing we are essentially technology. This is not just Silicon Valley or China. Right? The argument is essentially we are fancy technology. We just don't really know how fancy yet. But we are just the same than this very box here, just infinitely more complicated. If that's the case, then of course, we're going to converge with it, right? We're, we're going to you know, amalgamate. That is a key question when we think about how, what we're going to do when we talk about intelligence, right? Simply defined as the ability to accomplish, accomplish complex goals. So it's interesting, you know, when you, when you talk about artificial intelligence, which is defined as computer systems that can kind of do things like we usually do, then you have to worry about, is this the definition of AI? And I would say, well, basically, you know, X machine and those kind of, that's an interesting entertainment, but it's actually pretty far away from what AI means for, for us. Right? This is what AI means now. A car that can do the job, the basic job of some assisted driving. We can't sit in the back and eat a hamburger quite yet, but it's very useful. That's not really AI, it's more like IA, right? Intelligent assistance. Robots that can do the warehouses. Other robots that can do complex tasks, getting cheaper by the minute. I mean, Baxter is pretty intelligent, but it's as dumb as a toaster compared to, uh, compared to a human, right? And it can do only very narrow things. Google Lens. If you try the new Nexus phone, that's amazing. You hold it up over any object, any store, it will tell you what it is. I mean, you can hold it up over, over some clothes you want to buy or a book, and it will just tell you what it is. Right? But a human looking at a restaurant like this has an association of 5,000 average data points instantly. The smell, the sound, the people, the memories, the computer says, yes, it's a hamburger place. It's useful, but you know, let's not get too far out on this, you know, what computers can do with this quite yet. My favorite is this. It's called Do Not Pay. Okay? It's a bot that is a lawyer. Sorry about the lawyers in the room, but this bot is basically refuting parking tickets in New York City and London, or filing a, 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 the class action suit for Equifax on, on your behalf using data that you put in. It's essentially a robot bot, a, ro a lawyer bot. Right? I mean, give it a try sometimes. It's pretty amazing how it does it, but you know, it's extremely limited. So the bottom line is, you know, as you know, money is going up in AI these days. There's no limit to what people would spend on AI. You know, if you, if you open the browser in the morning, it says uh, Qualcomm will do AI, and these people will do AI, and then it's going to be AI, and you know, that's, that's the headline. <laughs> So, data is the new oil, and AI is the new electricity. I mean, we're getting literally to the place. Look at the top list of companies, Mary Meeker's report from just a few weeks ago. These are companies that are data companies. They're more powerful than oil companies, making more money, having less restrictions. They are the drivers of the economy, half American, half Chinese. Now, this is something we don't want to lose in America, right? <laughs> that we can, we can be on top of that pile. Of course, you know, we in Europe would like to contribute a little bit to that, too. Uh, eventually, that will happen. But, you know, Putin says that whoever is first in AI will be the ruler of the world. 
Is that a threat or a promise? I don't, I don't know. But that makes me worried about an AI arms race. You know, that would be a very, very bad idea. That's a very bad future if we look in this direction. But let's go back to what AI actually means. You know, humans really have three kinds of intelligence, social intelligence. Like, we know roughly if we're on the same level or, you know, if the other person is a king or, you know, an important person. We have social understanding. We have emotional intelligence, some of us. Yeah. Empathy, compassion, understanding. Hard to define what that actually is. Yeah. It's been tried, but... We have intellectual intelligence, we know things, and then basically there's a gap, and then afterwards we have the machines. The, the, the intelligence of machines is in a whole different category. Because, for example, when you talk to a client, the client has a problem. The client is not actually telling you precisely what he, what he wants, but you can read between the lines the client is pissed off about the price. Right? You know there is something there that you haven't heard. How would a machine do this? Huh? How would a machine deduct from what hasn't been said? You know, every psychologist knows that 95% of our interactions are actually subliminal. Very hard for a machine to do that. So what we have to worry about is that we give the machine too much authority. Not that they're going to come and take over or kill us or, you know, any such thing. I mean, that may eventually, eventually be an issue, but right now, as I said, they're mostly as dumb as a toaster, a apart from their regular work that they do in the narrow domain. So, the Polanyi paradox says we know a lot more than we can tell, and we can't automate what we don't understand. And yes, we can teach the machine to understand that, and we will, and we should. Right? But still, there's a point of where understanding goes beyond the zeros and ones. For example, a computer would never understand why I decide this today and tomorrow I have another decision. Right? Or why I lie, because it's required. And when I shouldn't lie. Right? And when I should cross a double yellow line or not. You know, those are all things that are hard to do. My colleague Luciani Foridi, an AI researcher, says, algorithms outperform human intelligence when it is not about understanding the human things, yeah. interpretation, semantic skills, sentience, consciousness, ethics. I look around here, what matters to our own lives is actually not data. Right? That matters to our businesses. What matters to us is the opposite of the algorithm, is what I call the andro rhythm, you know, the, the human things. And that will not change unless we stop being human. It's a very important point, I think, if we look at this. Computers and robots can go into our head, like Amazon Echo, Google Home, Siri, Cortana, and they can look around and they can look at 200 million data points. But you know, 200 million data points is a fraction of a nanosecond in my neurons. It will be interesting to have that. It will also get improved, but ultimately, you know, it's a place for this and a place for something else. The biggest danger is, as I said earlier, not that machines will take over, but that we become too much like them. And that means, for example, we stop socializing because we can do it through a screen. We don't bother dating in real life because we have Tinder. We just swipe, boom, done. And we, we forget things that used to be important to us. You know, it's trivial when it's about driving a car because, you know, Driving a car is not a human right. In Germany it might be, but you know, by and large, we can do without driving a car. Yeah, that's not going to hurt us. But can we do without deciding if we're going to have children or not, based on our own opinion rather than the DNA analysis? And should we be able to do that? What's going to happen to our free will right, when machines become really perfect? I mean, talking about free will, right? We've been manipulated by Russian Facebook feeds. 128 million people have been subjected to those messages in their inbox. I mean, is that just normal or is that the new future? We also have to think about, you know, in the end, we should not start confusing amazing simulations with actual human assistance. 
human resources analytics, for example. It's really powerful stuff. It's not the actual existence. Right? TripAdvisor isn't real. It's useful. But when I stand in front of a restaurant and I look inside, it's full of happy people. I, use, I go on TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor says, no, it's the worst place in town. Right? Do I go somewhere else just because of that? You know, I would be stupid to do that. I would rather wait. But yet people do that. Right? Trust the machine more than what they see. So in this future, we're going to talk to machines. That is basically a given. That's a huge business opportunity. You know, natural user language interfaces, bots, and so on. Here's a short clip. My AI is designed around human values of wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. You've been reading too much Elon Musk and watching too many Hollywood movies. There's a conference in Dubai last week where this robot was introduced called Sophia. Of course, the interesting part is that this robot is actually not responding at all. It's pre-programmed to say this. I mean, I know because I've been at those demos. It's rehearsed. It's an interesting way of saying, like, you know, we think that this, this, this robot actually has capability of doing that, but it's far from that. It's still useful. You know, if you're going to order a pizza, may as well order it from Sophia. Right? But what do I care about opinion about Elon Musk? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. But we're going to move into a world where artificial intelligence is everywhere. And I think I would maintain most of that is really IA. You know, it's intelligent amplification. That's very useful. At the same time, you could say, well, you know, it's it's convenient, it's cool, but it could be also de-skilling us. It could be creepy. It could have bias. It's something we have to keep a good eye on. I think a lot of customers in Europe would feel creepy about, for example, uh, the Google Home idea. You know, an open microphone. You know, the Germans aren't buying this. <laughs> you know, open microphone in your living room. Is that creepy? Is it good? I don't know. But you know, bottom line is that. Human happiness is not technology. Trust isn't digital. Happiness is not a program. Connectivity doesn't mean you're happy. Relationships aren't code. But the opposite is also not, is, is not true, right? If, if your technology does not engender contentment and happiness, it's a bad idea. Right? So we have to find a balance, a way forward that we can combine those two things. So. That's the threat of automation, right? We should first ask, what can we automate and make more efficient in our process? You know, that's good. But the second question should be, what should not be automated? What should not be connected? I think because otherwise the temptation is very big that we replace automation. We use automation to replace a human process, like HR, like making decisions. So this is what's going to happen with our jobs, of course. There's been many discussions about jobs becoming extinct, and that is a huge challenge for our society, and one that America is not prepared for at all. I mean, it's with them where, we, where I live, it's, you know, we have 7 million people. We don't have you know, 2 million people dri driving, driving trucks or so, right? 16 million people in the US drive a car or a truck as a job. Automation will not easily replace all of them. But, you know, a good five million, maybe, initially. So this question pops up all the time, you know, are humans the horses of the digital era? Some of you may still have horses for fun, but horses used to be everything, you know. We'd have a horse for transportation, and, and now horses are useless, right? So sometimes I like to say jokingly, if you can describe your job, it will be automated. Right? Take the test. You know, it's really interesting when you talk to people and say, you know, what do you do? And they have a hard time telling you, well, you know, they're safe. Right? <laughs> well, the bottom line is anything with routine 
is going to be automated. And this is the future that we have to face. Anything that can be digitized or automated will be. If you have kids, don't let your kids learn anything that is routine, whether it's programming or bookkeeping or financial advice on the bottom level. And the reverse, of course, is also true. Anything that cannot be automated or digitized or robotized, virtualized, becomes extremely important. That's why we're here. So we should give humans more credit when it's about the future of work. We are going to lose a lot of tasks to machines. You know, I think machines will replace our tasks, not our work. We have to move up the food chain. This will be very hard to do for, for a cab driver. You know, there is no food chain after driving. But generally speaking, you know, we're going to discover new jobs that are more emphasizing these kind of ideas, what I call the algorithms. So let's talk about digital ethics, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of summaries. First, you know, we have sort of an increased future shock today. Future shock was a book by Alvin Toffler, but people feel worried about the future because all these things are happening is just insurmountable amount of things. Right? There's a lot of fear and anxiety, especially about robots right? and automation. And then we have, of course, things that are currently happening in the world, Catalonia. Right? Parakana says that devolution, the decentralization of power, is a consequence of connectivity. I mean, right, what's happening right now in, in Spain and Catalonia is, a, is really, really very, very difficult place eh? on both sides. And we have that everywhere in Europe. There may be 20 new states in Europe in five years. I mean, we're talking about a, a future that will be shaped by media. And Pierre Omidia, from uh, uh, founder of, uh, was it PayPal? No, eBay? eBay, yeah? Well, no, sorry. PayPal, I think, right? Uh, he wrote the other day in the New York Times that basically social media has created a generous host for the issues we're currently facing, right? interference. So social media has become, in many ways, asocial. And it's an interesting angle. You know, we're talking about this every day now when we're looking at Facebook and all the current issues. Like Facebook is the best performing technology stock in the entire sector. At the same time, Diane Feinstein, who is not known for criticizing tech, she said yesterday in Washington, that Facebook has created these platforms and now they're being misused and you have to be the ones to do something about it or we will. Now that is one serious threat from, from a, a, a senator that's usually exactly the opposite. The bottom line is now that technology companies are responsible for what they create, becoming responsible. And I think this is a very, very big change in our overall story because ultimately, you know, this is what it's all about. Elephants, no, just kidding, trust. Right? I mean, we are literally sleeping at the foot of the elephant when we use technology. And you know, we trust that they will catch us. And this is becoming a, a key issue, I think, in our society. And the New York Times headline on their homepage was just a few days ago. I mean, this, this is also a huge shift in, in thinking, right? I'm not saying that's true or not. You know, this is obviously a big discussion. Right? And what is a friend, you know, Silicon Valley? What is Silicon Valley? <laughs> but here's a message to Silicon Valley. It's no longer good enough to just disrupt. You also have to construct. So think about your business when you're thinking about the future. Adoring disruption is nice. You know, it's fun. It's been fun for a while, you know, unicorns and so on. Right? But that's not the future. The future is to build something. Right? If Uber and Airbnb and others like that will be successful, they have to figure out how to generate value in the long run. Not from all the willing workers that are willing to work in the gig economy. So looking at a, at a larger future here. So the key takeaways are this. First, the future is not like the present. If there's one thing that's for certain is that we can simply say that in five to seven years, most of our companies will have to generate 50 to 70% different revenue streams from today. We have to constantly make a new window. Kevin Kelly in his new book says, 
we are no longer being something as a company, we are always becoming something. That requires a different mindset. You know, this is not about tech. It's also about tech when you don't have it to support that process, right? But this is about figuring out what it is. So to deal with this exponential feature, you have to come back from the future. This is an approach I use with my clients. You know, we don't say we're going to take today's business and just amend it a little bit, you know, put a Band-Aid on and make maybe a new arm or something. We move into the future. You have to actually go to the future five to seven years from now and come back with what you've learned and then apply it, coming back from the future. What do we know about the future in five to seven years? Well, if you sit down for a week, you think about five to seven years from today, you'll have pages of stuff that is certain to happen. Right? The end of oil, right? cognitive computing, language understanding, automatic translation, image understanding. I mean, all the stuff that we see every day around us. So it's very important. Right? We have to expect huge shifts in business paradigms and economic logic. And I would submit most of that is good. This is Switzerland last year. We had a vote on the basic income guarantee, you know, which is basically uh, a measly $2,700 a month, uh, regarding irrespective of how much work you do. 26% of Swiss people voted for this. I mean, if he had that vote here, it would be 0.00. .00 I think that's ultimately a destination that we're going to. Elon Musk agrees, you know, automation will make that kind of idea probably uh, mandatory in the near future. So we're moving into a world where this is becoming the new paradigm of operations. Right? People, planet, profit. And we've talked about this for 50 years. It didn't happen. There was no commercial room for it. <laughs> but clearly now, if we don't think about people, planet, profit, we just think profit. Think about AI and human genome editing, geoengineering. That would be the end of it, right? quite simply put. Right? We have to think larger. And as a business, you have to think about that paradigm because that is the new measuring stick for the stock market in just a five or seven year time frame. In fact, I predict there will be a new stock market for companies that think like this, like a NASDAQ for a triple bottom line. So how do we understand this future? Yeah. It requires some wisdom. That is so crucial. And you are here in this room together, wisdom, you know, in the conversations that we're having. Four things, observe. Observe the future. 5% of your time should be spent with looking at the future. Not 50 years from now, three, four, five years, you know, the immediate future. Understand. Yeah. Understand requires listening. Yeah. You can talk to your kids, but you don't really understand because you haven't listened. And that's hard to do. Imagination. This is your number one weapon against unemployment. Computer has no skill of imagination. Yeah, they can predict things based on data, but can they actually create? They can write a piece of music. That's a simulation. Finally, act on foresights. Jeff Bezos acted on four sides when he made the Kindle. Nobody asked for the Kindle. So that's really crucial for us for our future. Uh, crucial skills, I'll skip this because we're on a little bit out of time here, but the uh, World Economic Forum roughly says that, you know, this is are the new skills we need, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence. I haven't skipped it after all, I suppose. But <laughs> anyway, that's our brain today, right? And half of that brain will be taken over by machines because machines will learn the left part, you know, the logical part, that that part of our brain will be accomplished by machines in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and that is, of course, a very old definition of the brain. You know, it doesn't really exist, the left and right. Uh, but the crucial skill is, you know, we have to get used to the fact that machines can do this. I have to move on, you know, the moving to facts that only us can do. And that includes emotional intelligence. And we should not focus so much on efficiency. You know, if you're worried about efficiency and you want to use tech to be efficient, that's great. But, you know, that's a five-year window, and then you are efficient. 
focus less more on, on efficiency and more on creating new values, human values. Use technology to create human values. That is the ultimate goal. Because nobody can replace you if you have human values. Everybody replaces you when you're just technology. So that's a very important lesson I think that we can learn. You know, we have to put the human back inside of our technology. I mean, if you can automate and make things more efficient, by all means, you should do that, of course. But don't do it on the cost of taking the human out. Because your value goes like this. I mean, humans are about relationships. And, you know, so that's our future. We have to decide which part you're playing on. Uh, technology can be both. It can be evil. can be great. Right? Where do you position yourself? That is the key question. Every time you launch a new software, a new product, you invest somewhere, you have to ask the question, is this going to be positive for human flourishing? for my clients, for my customers. Not just in the sense of the bottom line, right? but in the larger sense. That's how value is being generated in the future. So we have to look at this future as having two things, you know, technology, algorithms, and humanity, and what I call the algorithms. Uh, that is our mix. That is inevitable. And we have to invest in both. I mean, it would be foolish if we weren't investing in technology. But I would submit it would be more foolish if we weren't investing in people, and removing people from the food chain. So I'd like to uh, paraphrase Steve Jobs, rest in peace. Uh, stay hungry, stay human. Steve Jobs said, stay hungry, stay foolish. I, I guess that's the same thing, right? So uh, that would be my appeal to you, stay hungry, stay human, and uh, read the book for more. Thanks very much for listening. Hey everyone, this year I'm doing a series of public discussions on uh, the future of the internet and society and some of the big issues around that. And um, today I'm here with Yuval Noah Harari, uh, a, a great historian and uh, best-selling author of, of a number of books. Uh, his first book, Sapiens, a, a brief history of humankind, uh, kind of chronicled and did an analysis uh, going from the early days of hunter-gatherer society to now how our civilization is organized. And uh, your next two books, The uh, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, uh, actually tackle important issues of technology uh, and the future. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a lot of what we'll talk about today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most historians... Um, you know, only t tackle and, and, um, and analyze the past, but, yeah. you know, but a lot of the work that you've done has had uh, really interesting um, insights and, and raised important questions for the future. So I'm really glad to have an opportunity to, to talk with you today. So Yuval, thank you for, for joining uh, for, for this conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I think that if historians and philosophers cannot engage with the current questions of technology and the future of humanity, then we aren't doing our jobs. And we are not just supposed to chronicle events, you know, centuries ago. All the people that lived in the past are dead. They don't care. The question is what happens to us and mm -hmm. to the, the people in the future. Yeah. All right, so all the questions that you've outlined, where, where should we start here? I mean, I think one of the big topics that we've talked about is around, um, you know, this dualism around whether, uh, with all of the technology and progress that has been made, um, are, are people coming together and are we becoming more unified? Um, or um, you know, is, our, is our world becoming more fragmented? Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm curious to, to start off by how, how you're thinking about that. And I mean, that's mm. probably a, a, a big area. We could probably spend most of the time on, on that topic. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, at the long span of history, then it's obvious that humanity is becoming more and more connected. Um, if thousands of years ago, Planet Earth was actually a galaxy of a lot of isolated worlds mm -hmm. with almost no connection between them. 
So gradually people came together and became more and more connected until we reach today when the entire world for the first time is a single historical, economic and, and cultural unit. But connectivity doesn't necessarily mean harmony. The people we fight most often are our own family members and, and neighbors and friends. So um, it, it's really a question of are we talking about connecting people or are we talking about harmonizing people? Mm -hmm. uh, connecting people can lead to a lot of conflicts. And when you look at the world today, you see this duality, um, for example, in, 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 the, in, the, in the rise of walls, which we talked a lot about earlier when, when, when we met, yeah. which for me is something that I just can't figure out what, what is happening mm -hmm. because you have all this you know, new connecting technology and the internet and virtual realities and social networks. And, and then the most, one of the top political issues becomes building walls. And not just, you know, cyber walls or firewalls, building stone walls. Like the most stone age technology is suddenly the most advanced technology. So what, how to make sense of this world, which is more connected than ever, but at the same time is building more walls than ever before? Yeah, well, I think one of the interesting questions is around whether there's actually so much of a conflict between these ideas of people becoming more connected um, and uh, this fragmentation that you, that you talk about. I mean, it, it, one of the things that it seems to me is that we, in the 21st century, in order to address the biggest opportunities and challenges that humanity has, right? So I think it's both opportunities, spreading prosperity, spreading peace, um, scientific progress, um, as well as some of the big challenges, right? Addressing climate change, um, making sure that, um, you know, on the flip side, that diseases don't spread and there aren't epidemics and, and things like that. We, we really need to be able to come together um, and, and have the world be more connected. But at the same time, that only works if, um, if we as, as individuals have our economic and, um, and social and, and spiritual needs met. And you know, so one way to think about this is in terms of um, fragmentation, mm -hmm. uh, but another way to think about it is in terms of uh, personalization, right? And you know, you know, I just think about you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, one of the big things that I think that the internet enables is, is for people to um, connect with groups of people who, who share their real uh, values and interests. And it wasn't always like this, right? Before the internet, you were really tied to uh, your physical location. Uh, and and I, I just think about how, how when I was growing up, um, you know, I grew up in a town of about 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there were, there were only, um, you know, so many different clubs or activities that you could do. So I grew up, like a lot of the other kids, um, playing Little League baseball. And... And, you know, I, I, I kind of think about this in retrospect. It's like, I'm not really into baseball. I'm not really an athlete. So why did I play um, Little League when, you know, my real passion was programming computers? And, you know, the, the reality was that growing up, there was no one else really in my town who was into programming computers. So I didn't have a, a peer group or a club that I could do that. It wasn't until I went to boarding school um, and then later college uh, where I actually was able to meet people who were into the same things as I am. Mm -hmm. And... Now I think with the internet, that's starting to change, right? And, and now um, you have the ability to not just be tethered to your physical location, but to find people who have um, more niche interests and, and different kind of subcultures and communities um, on the internet, which I think is a really powerful thing. But it also means that, you know, me growing up today, I wouldn't have I probably wouldn't have played Little League. And you can think about me playing Little League as... Um, you know, that, that, that could have been a unifying thing where, you know, there weren't that many things in my town. So that was a thing that brought people together. So maybe, you know, if, I'm, if I was creating or if I was a part of a, of, 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 of a community online that might have been more meaningful to me, uh, getting to know real people, but around programming, which is my real interest, um, you would have said that our community growing up would have been more fragmented, right? Mm -hmm. And people wouldn't have had um, the, the same kind of sense of, 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 of um, physical community. So when I think about these problems, I mean, one of the questions that, that I wonder is maybe, you know, fragmentation and personalization or finding what, what you actually care about are two sides of the same coin. But the bigger challenge that I worry about is whether there are a number of people who are just left behind in the transition um, who, 
you know, were people who would have played Little League but haven't now found their new community and now just feel dislocated. And you know, maybe their primary orientation in the world um, is still um, their, the, the physical community that they're in, um, you know, or, um, or they haven't really been able to find um, a, a community mm -hmm. of people who they're, who they're interested in. And as the world has progressed, um, you know, I think a lot of people feel, feel lost in that way. And that, that probably contributes to some of the, the feelings. That, that would be my, my hypothesis, at least. I mean, that's the social version of it. There's also the economic version around mm -hmm. globalization, which I yeah. think is as important. But, but, but I'm curious what, what, you, what you think about that. Yeah, about the social issue, well, online, co online communities can be a wonderful thing, but they are still incapable of replacing physical communities because there are still so many that's things true. That's that true. you can that's only true. do with your, uh, in, 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 with your body mm -hmm. and with your physical friends. And you can travel with your mind throughout the world, but, but not with your body. And um, th there is a huge question about the cost and benefits there. Mm -hmm. And also the, the ability of people to just escape yeah. things they don't like in online communities, but you can't do it. In, in real offline communities. I mean, you can unfriend your Facebook friends, mm -hmm. but you can't unneighbor your neighbors. You're, they are still there. Yeah. I mean, you can take yourself and move to another country if you, if, if you have the means, but most people can't. So part of the, of the logic of traditional communities was that you must learn how to get along with people you don't like necessarily, maybe, uh, and you must, develop social mechanisms how to do that. Mm -hmm. And with online communities, I mean, and, and they have done some really wonderful things for, 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 for people, but also they kind of um, don't give us the experience of, of, of doing these difficult but important yeah. things. Yeah, and, and I definitely don't mean to state that, um, that online communities can, can replace everything that a physical community did. Mm -hmm. the, the most meaningful online communities that we see are ones that span online and offline, that bring people together. Uh, maybe the, the original organization might be online, but, mm -hmm. um, but people are coming together um, physically because that's, that ultimately is really important for relationships and, and for, I mean, because we're physical beings, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so whether it's, you know, there are, there are lots of examples around whether it's an interest community where people, you know, care about running, but they also care about cleaning up the environment. So a group of people organize on, online and then they, they um, you know, every week go for a run along a beach or through a town and clean up garbage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's like a, a physical thing. I mean, we, we hear um, about communities where, you know, people, um, if, you're, if you're in a profession, um, you know, maybe the military or maybe something else where you have to move around a lot, um, people uh, form these communities of, of um, you know, military families or, mm. or families of, of um, you know, groups that, that travel around and, you know, the first thing they do when they go to a new city is they, they find that community and then that's how they get integrated into, um, into the, local, mm -hmm. uh, the local physical community too. So th that's, that's obviously a, a super important uh, part of this that I, that I don't mean to, to, to understand. Yeah, and then the, the question, you know, the, the practical question for also a, a service provider like Facebook is what is the goal? I mean, mm -hmm. are we trying to connect people so ultimately they will leave the screens and go and play football or pick up garbage? Or are we trying to keep them as long as possible on the screens? And there is yeah. a, 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 a conflict of interest there. Yeah. I mean, you could have, 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 I mean, one model would be we want people to stay as little as possible online, mm -hmm. we just need them to stay there the, the shortest time necessary to form the connection, which will, they will then go mm -hmm. and do something in the outside world. Yeah. And that's one of the key questions, I think, about what the internet is doing to people, whether it's connecting them or fragmenting society. Yeah, and, and I think your, your point is right. I mean, we basically went, we've made this big shift in our systems to make sure that they're optimized for meaningful social interactions, which of course the most meaningful interactions that you can have are physical offline interactions. And mm -hmm. there's always this question when you're building a, a uh, service of, of how you measure the, the different thing that you're trying to optimize for. So, you know, it's a lot easier for us to measure um, if people are interacting or messaging online than if you're having a, a meaningful mm -hmm. connection physically. Um, 
But there are ways to get at that. I mean, you can ask people questions about what, what the most meaningful things that they did. You can't ask you know, all you know, two billion people, but you can have a, a statistical subsample of that mm-hmm. and um, have people come in and, and, and tell you, okay, what are the most meaningful things that I was able to do um, today and how many of them were enabled by me um, you know, connecting with people online or how much of it was me connecting with someone physically, maybe around the dinner table um, with content or something that I learned online or saw. Um, so so that, that is definitely a really important part of it. But I think one of the important and interesting questions is about the richness of the world um, that can be built where you have, um, on, on one level, unification or, or, or this global connection where there's a, a common framework where people can connect. Maybe it's through using um, you know, common internet services or maybe it's just common social norms as you travel mm-hmm. around. Um, you know, one of the things that you'd pointed out to me in a, in a, in a, in a previous conversation is now um, a, a, something that's different from in any other time in history is you could travel to almost any other country and you know, look like you, you know, dress like you're, you're appropriate and that you fit in there. And if you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago, that just wouldn't have been the case. If you went to a different country, you would have just stu- stood out immediately. So there's, um, there's this norm, there's this level of um, cultural norm um, that is united but then the question is, what do we build on top of that? And I think one of the things that a, that a broader kind of set of cultural norms or, um, or, or shared values and, and framework enables is a richer set of subcultures and subcommunities and people to actually go find the things that they're interested in um, in lots of different communities um, to be created that wouldn't have existed before. You know, going back to, to my story before, it wasn't just my town that had a had little league. You know, I think it, when, when I was growing up, um, you know, basically every town had had very similar um, things. You know, there's a little league in every in every town, and you know, maybe instead of uh, you know, every town having having little league, um, there should be little league should be an option. Mm-hmm. Um, but but uh, but if you wanted to do something that not that many people were interested in, in my case, programming, um, in other people's case, maybe um, you know, interest in some um, part of history or some part of art that there just may may not be another person in your ten thousand person town who share that interest. I think it's good if you can form those kind of communities, um, mm-hmm. and now people have. Um, can, can find connections and can find a group of people who share their interest. And I think that there's a question, though, of you can look at that as fragmentation, right? Because now we're not all doing the same things, right? We're not all, um, you know, going to church and playing Little League and um, mm. doing the, the exact same things. Um, or you can think about that as richness and, mm. and depthness in our, in our social lives. Um, and I just think that that's an interesting question, is where you want the commonality across the world um, and, and the connection, and where um, where you actually want that commonality to enable um, deeper richness, even if that means that people are doing different things. And I'm, I'm curious if you have a view on that and where that's positive versus where mm-hmm. that um, creates a lack of social cohesion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think almost nobody would argue with the benefits of a um, richer social environment in which people have more options uh, to connect around all kinds of things. The, the, the key question is how do you still create enough social cohesion on a level of a country and increasingly also on the level of the entire globe in order to tackle our, uh, our, our, our main problems. I mean, we need global cooperation like never before because we are facing unprecedented global problems. We just had Earth Day, mm-hmm. and um, to be obvious to everybody, we cannot deal with the problems of, of the environment, of climate change, except through global cooperation. Similarly, if you think about the, uh, the, dis- the potential disruption caused by new technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, we need to find a mechanism for global cooperation around issues like how to prevent an AI arms race, Mm -hmm. how to prevent different countries racing to build autonomous weapon systems and killer robots and and weaponizing the internet and weaponizing social networks. Um, Unless we have global cooperation, we can't stop that because every country will say, well, we don't want to produce killer robots, it's a bad idea, but we can't allow our rivals to do it before us, so we must do it first and then you have a race to the bottom. Similarly, if you think about the potential disruptions to the job market and the economy caused by AI and automation. So 
you know, it's quite obvious that there will be jobs in the future, mm -hmm. but will they be evenly distributed between different parts of the world? Uh, one of the potential results of the AI revolution could be the concentration of immense wealth in some part of the world and the complete bankrupt bankruptcy of, of other parts. There will be lots of new jobs for software engineers in California, but there will be maybe no jobs for textile workers and truck drivers in Honduras and Mexico. So what will they do? If we don't find a solution on the global level, like creating a global safety net to protect humans against the shocks of AI mm -hmm. and enable them, enabling them to use the opportunities of AI, then we will create the most unequal economic uh, uh, situation th 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 that ever existed. It will be much worse even than what happened in the Industrial Revolution when some countries industrialized, most countries didn't, and the few industrial powers went on to conquer and dominate and exploit all the others. So how do we create enough global cooperation mm -hmm. so that the enormous benefits of AI and automation don't uh, don't go only, say, yeah. to California and Eastern China, while the rest of the world is being left far behind. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's important. So I would unpack that into two sets of issues. Mm -hmm. One around AI and um, the future economic and geopolitical issues around that. And, um, and let's, let's put that aside for a second, because I actually mm -hmm. think we should spend 15 minutes on that. I mean, that's okay. a that's a big, yeah, that's a big, that's a, that's a big yeah. set of things. Um, but then the, the other question is around how do you create the global cooperation that's necessary to take advantage of, of the big opportunities that are ahead and to address the big challenges, right? I don't think it's just fighting crises like, like climate change. I, I think that there are massive opportunities around global Definitely, yeah. Uh, uh, spreading prosperity, spreading uh, more human rights and, and freedom. Mm -hmm. um, those are things that come with trade and, and, and connection as well. So I think that you want, you want that for the upside. Um, but I guess... My, my diagnosis at, on, uh, at this point, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your, your, your view on this, is um, I actually think we've spent a lot of the last 20 years with the internet, um, maybe even longer, um, working on global trade, global information flow, mm -hmm. um, making it so that people can connect. I actually think the bigger challenge at this point is... Um, making it so that in addition to that global framework that we have, uh, making it so that things work for people locally, right? Because I think that there's this dualism here where you, you need both, right? If you, if you just, um, if you resort to uh, just kind of local um, tribalism, then you miss the opportunity to work on, mm -hmm. on the really important global issues. But if you have um, a global framework, but people feel like it's not working for them at home or some set of people don't feel, mm -hmm. feel like that's not working, then they're not politically going to support um, the, the global collaboration that needs to have happen. And I think, yeah. you know, there's the social version of this, which, um, which we talked about a little bit uh, before, where, you know, people are, are now able to find communities that match their interests more, but some people haven't found those communities yet and, and, and are, are left behind as some of the more physical communities um, And some of these communities are quite nasty also, so the, the, we shouldn't yes. forget that. Yes, so, so I think they, they should be, yes. Um, although I would argue that um, people joining... Um, kind of extreme communities is largely a result of, um, of, of not having healthier communities and not having healthy economic progress for individuals. I think most people, when they are, feel good about their lives, they don't seek out extreme communities. So there's a lot of work that I think we, as, as an internet platform provider, need to do to, to, um, to, to lock that down even further. But, but I actually huh. think creating prosperity is probably one of, the one of the better ways at a macro level to go at that. But, but I guess... But um, I, I, I will <clears throat> maybe just stop there a little. People that feel good about themselves have done some of the most terrible things in human history. I mean, uh, we shouldn't confuse people feeling good uh, about themselves and about their lives with people being benevolent and, 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 and kind and, and, and so forth. And also, they wouldn't say that their ideas are extreme. Um, and we have, you know, so many examples throughout human history from the Roman Empire to slave trade in, in the modern age and, and colonialism that people, that, that they had a very good life 
they had a very good family life and social life, they were nice people. I mean, I guess, I don't know, most Nazi voters were also nice people. If you meet them for, for, for a cup of coffee and you talk about your kids, they are nice people. And they think good things about themselves and maybe some of them can have very happy lives. And even the ideas that we look back and say this was terrible, this was extreme, they didn't think so. Um, again, if you just just think about colonial, well, well, but but World War II, and and that came through a, a period of intense economic and social disruption after yeah, the so, Industrial Revolution. The, the, and, let, let's let's put and aside the, so, the, the the extreme example. Let's just think about European colonialism in the 19th century. So people say in Britain, in the late 19th century, they had the best life in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't suffer from an economic crisis or disintegration of society or anything like that. And they thought that by going all over the world and conquering and uh, changing societies in India, in Africa, in Australia, they were bringing lots of good to, to, to the world. Um, and I, I'm just saying that so that we are, we are more careful about not confusing the good feelings people mm -hmm. have about their life. It's not just miserable people suffering well, from poverty and economic crisis. Well, I think that there's a difference between the example that you're using of a, of a wealthy society um, going and, uh, and colonizing or, or doing different things that, mm -hmm. that um, had, had different negative effects. Um, that wasn't the fringe in that society. I guess what, what, I'm, what I was more uh, reacting to before was your point about people becoming extremists. I would, I would argue that in, in, in those societies, that wasn't those people becoming extremists. There's a, you can have a, a, a long debate about any part of history and whether the direction that a society chose to take is positive or, or negative and the ramifications of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think today we have a specific issue, which is that... Um, more people um, are, are seeking out solutions um, at the extremes, and I think a lot of that is because of a feeling of dislocation, both economic and social. Um, so that, now I think that there's a lot of ways that you go at that, mm -hmm. and, and I think part of it, I mean, as, as someone who's running one of the internet platforms, I think we have a, a special responsibility to make sure that, that, um, that, that our systems aren't encouraging that. Um, but I think broadly, the more macro um, solution for, for this is, is to make sure that people feel like they have that grounding and that sense of purpose and community mm. um, and, and that their lives are, um, and, and that they're, they have opportunity. And, and I think that, you know, statistically what we see in, in, in sociologically is that when people have those opportunities, they don't, on balance, um, as much seek out those kind of groups. And, and I think that there's, there's the social version of this. There's also the economic version. I mean, this is the basic story of globalization is um, on the one hand, it's been extremely positive for bringing a lot of people into the global economy, right? People in you know, India and Southeast Asia and across Africa who wouldn't have uh, previously had access to a lot of jobs in the global economy now do. And there's been probably the greatest, at a global level, um, inequality is weighed down, right? Because all, all, you know, hundreds of millions of people um, have, have, are, have come out of poverty, and that's been positive. Um, but the big issue has been that um, in developed countries, uh, there have been a, a large number of people who are now competing with, with all these other people who are joining the economy, and jobs are moving to these other places. So um, a lot of people have lost jobs. For, the, for some of the people who haven't lost jobs, there's now more competition for those mm -hmm. jobs um, for, for people internationally, so their wages. Um, that's one of the factors I, I, I would... Um, the analyses have shown that 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 is um, that's preventing um, more wage growth, and there are you know five to ten percent of people, according to to a lot of the analyses that I that I've shown, who are who are actually in absolute terms worse off because of globalization. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that globalization for the whole world is um, is negative. I think in, in general it's been um, it's been on balance positive, but the story we've told about it has probably been. Um, too optimistic in that you know we've only talked about the positives and how it's good mm -hmm. um, as as this global uh, movement to to bring people out of poverty and create more opportunities. And the reality, I think, has been that it's been net very positive. But you know, if there are five or ten percent of people in the world who are worse off, you know, there's seven billion people in the world. So that's 
many hundreds of millions of people, um, the majority of whom are, are likely in, um, in the most developed countries in the U.S. and across Europe, mm -hmm. that's going to create a lot of political pressure um, on, on those, in those countries. So in order to have a global system that works, it feels like you, you need it to work at the global level, but then you also need individuals in each of the, the member nations in that system um, to feel like it's working for them too. And that recurses all the way down. So you know, in local cities and communities, people need to feel like it's working for them, both economically and, um, and mm -hmm. socially. So I guess at this point, the thing that I worry about and, and I've rotated a lot of Facebook's energy to, to try to focus on this, is you know, our mission used to be connecting the world. Now it's about um, helping people build communities and bring people closer together. And a lot of that is because I actually think that the thing that we need to do to, to support um, more global connection at this point is making sure that things work for people locally. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, in a lot of ways we, we've made it so the internet, you know, so that an emerging creator can... But, but um, how do you balance working it locally for people in the American Midwest and at the same time working it better for people in Mexico, or South America or, or Africa? I mean, part of the imbalance is that when people in Middle America mm -hmm. are angry, mm -hmm. everybody pays attention because they have, they have their finger on the button. But if people in Mexico or people in Zambia feel angry, we care far less because they have far less power. I mean, the pain, and I'm not saying the pain is not real, the pain is definitely real, but the pain of somebody in Indiana is reverberates around the world far more than the pain of somebody in Honduras or in the Philippines, simply because of the imbalances of, of, of the power in the world. And I mean, earlier, what, what we said about fragmentation, I know that Facebook faces a lot of criticism about uh, in, uh, kind of encouraging people, some people to, to, to move to these extremist groups. But I, I, that's a big problem, but I don't think it's the main problem. I think also it's, it's something that you can solve if you put enough, in, enough energy into that. That is something you can solve. And, but this is the problem that gets most of the attention now. What I worry more, again, not just about Facebook, about the entire direction that uh, the new internet economy and the new tech economy is, is going towards, is uh, increasing inequality between different parts of the world which is not the result of extremist ideology, but the result of a certain economic and political model. And secondly, undermining um, human agency and undermining the, the, the basic philosophical ideas of democracy and the free market and individualism. These, I would say, are my two greatest concerns about the development of technology like, like AI and, and machine learning. And this is this is this is this will continue to be a major problem, even if we find solutions to the issue of uh, social extremism in in, in, in particular groups. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I certainly agree that that extremism isn't is. I would think about it more as a symptom and mm -hmm. a, a big issue that that needs to be worked on. But um, but but I think the the bigger question is making sure that everyone has a sense of purpose, has a role that they feel matters, um, and social connections. Because at, at the end of the day, we're social animals. And mm -hmm. I think it's easy in our, in our theoretical thinking to, um, to abstract that away, but, but that's, um, that's such a fundamental part of, of, of who we are. So that's why I focus on that. Um, I don't know, do, do you want to move over to some of the AI issues? Because I think that that's a um, or or do, you, do you want to stick on this topic for a no, second? No, I mean, or? this topic is, is, is closely connected to, to AI. Um, again, because I think that, you know, one of the disservices that science fiction, and I'm a huge fan of, of science fiction, but I think it has done some, some, also mm -hmm. some, some pretty bad things, which is to focus attention on the wrong, the wrong scenarios and the wrong dangers. That people think, oh, AI is dangerous because the robots are coming to kill us. And this is extremely unlikely uh, that we'll, we'll face a robot rebellion. I'm much more frightened about robots always obeying orders than about robots rebelling uh, against, against the humans. I think the two 
main problems with AI, and we can explore this in, in greater depth, is what I just mentioned. First, increasing inequality between different parts of the world, because you'll have some countries which uh, lead and dominate the new AI economy. And this is such a huge advantage that it kind of trumps ev everything else. And we will see, I mean, if we had the Industrial Revolution creating this huge gap between a few industrial powers and everybody else, and then it took 150 years to close the gap. Mm -hmm. And over the last few decades, the gap has been closed or, or, or closing, mm -hmm. as more and more countries which are far behind are catching up. Now the gap may reopen and be much worse than ever before uh, because of the rise of AI and because AI is likely to be do dominated by just a, a small number of countries. So that's the one issue, AI and inequality. And the other issue is AI and human agency, uh, or even the, the meaning of human life. What happens when um, AI is mature enough and you have enough data to basically hack human beings, and you have an AI that knows me better than I know myself and can uh, make decisions for me, predict my choices, manipulate my choices, and authority increasingly shifts from humans to algorithms. So not only decisions about which movie to see, but even decisions like which community to join, mm. uh, who to befriend, whom to marry, we increasingly rely on the recommendations of, of the AI. And what does it do to human life and human agency? So these are, I would say, the two most important issues of AI inequality and AI and, and human agency. Yeah. And I, I think both of them get down to a, a similar question around values, right? And, and who's building this and what are the values that are encoded and, mm -hmm. and, and how does that end, end up playing out? Um, yeah, I, I tend to think that in a lot of the conversations around AI, we, we almost personify AI, right? Your, your point around killer robots or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but I actually think it's, AI is very connected to um, the general tech sector, right? So almost every technology product and, and increasingly a lot of um, n not what you call technology products um, mm -hmm. have, are, are made better in some way by AI. So it's not like AI is a monolithic thing that you build. It's, it, it, it powers a lot of products, so, it, so it's a lot of economic progress mm. and, and can get towards some of the, the distribution of, of opportunity questions that you're raising. Um, but it also is fundamentally interconnected with, um, with these really socially important questions around data um, and privacy and, and how we want our data to be used and what are the policies around that and what are mm. the, the global frameworks. Um, and so one of the big questions that so, so I tend to uh, agree with a lot of the, um, the the questions that you're raising, which is that a, a lot of the countries that have the ability to invest in future technology, of which AI and, and data and, and future internet technologies are certainly an important area, are doing that because it will give you know their local companies um, an advantage in the future, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to be the ones that are exporting services um, around the world. Um, you know, I tend to think that right now, um, you know, the United States has a, a major um, advantage that a lot of the global technology platforms um, are made here. Mm -hmm. And you know, certainly a lot of the, the values um, that are encoded in that um, are shaped largely by, by American values. They're not only, I mean, we, and I, speaking for Facebook, I mean, we serve people around the world and we take that very seriously, but you know, certainly ideas like giving everyone a voice um, that's something that um, is probably very shaped by the, um, by the American ideas around free speech and, and, and strong adherence to that. Um, so I think culturally and economically, um, there's an advantage to, for, for countries to develop, um, to, to kind of push forward the state of, of, of the field and, um, and, and have the, the companies that in the next generation are the, the strongest companies in that. So certainly you see different countries uh, trying to do that. And th this is very tied up in, um, in not just economic prosperity do, and inequality, but also... Do they have a also... real chance? I mean, does a country like Honduras, Ukraine, Yemen has any real chance of joining the AI race? 
or are they or they are already out? I mean, they are, it's not going to happen in Yemen. It's not going to happen in Honduras. And then what happens to them? In 20 well, well, years or 50 some of this, years. Some of this gets down to the values around how it's developed, though. What is, um, you know, I, I think that there are certain advantages that countries with larger populations have because you can get to critical mass in terms mm -hmm. of universities and industry and, 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 and investment and things like that. But one of the values um, that we hear, right, both at Facebook and I think generally in the, the academic system of trying to do research hold is, is that you do open research, right? So a lot of the work that's getting invested into, mm. um, in, into these advances, um, in theory, if this works well, should be more open. So then you can have an entrepreneur um, in one of these countries that you're mm. talking about, which you know, maybe isn't, isn't a whole industry-wide thing. And um, you know, certainly, I think you'd bet against, you know, sitting here today that in the future all of the AI companies are going to be in a, in a, in a, in a given small country. Um, but I, I don't think it's far-fetched to believe that there will be an entrepreneur in some place who can use Amazon Web Services to spin up instances for compute, mm -hmm. um, who can uh, hire people across the world in a globalized economy, and can leverage research that has been done in the US or across Europe or in different open academic institutions or companies that increasingly are publishing their work um, that, are, that are pushing the state of the art forward on that. So mm -hmm. I think that there's this big question about what we want the future to look like. And part of the way that I think we want the future to look is we want it to be uh, we want it to be open. We want the research to be open. I think we want the internet to be a platform. And this gets back to your unification point versus fragmentation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big risks, I think, for the future is that the um, the internet policy in each country ends up looking different and ends up being fragmented. And if that's the case, then I think um, the entrepreneur in the countries that you're talking about in Honduras probably doesn't have as big of a chance if they can't leverage the... Um, the um, all, all the advances that are happening everywhere. But if, but if the internet stays one thing and the research stays open, um, then I think that they have a much better shot. So when I, when I look towards the future, one of the things that I, that I just get very worried about um, is the values that I just laid out are not values that all countries share. Mm. Um, and when you get into some of the more authoritarian countries and their um, data policies, they're very different from the kind of regulatory frameworks that... Mm -hmm. um, that across Europe and, and across a lot of other people people are talking about or have put into place. And um, you know, just to, to put a finer point on it, and recently I've come out and I've been uh, very vocal that I think that more countries should adopt um, a privacy framework like GDPR in Europe. And a lot of people, I think, have been confused about this. Like, well, why are you arguing for, for more privacy regulation? Um, you know, why now, given that in the past you, um, you, you weren't as positive on it? And I think part of the reason why, why I am so focused on this now is I think at this point, people around the world recognize um, that these questions around data and AI and technology are important. So there's going to be a framework in every country. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like we're, there's not going to be regulation or policy. Um, so I actually think the bigger question is, what is it going to be? And the most likely alternative to, um, to each country adopting something that, that encodes the freedoms and rights of something like GDPR, um, in, in my mind, the most likely alternative is the authoritarian model, which is, um, is currently uh, being spread, mm -hmm. um, which says, uh, you know, as every company needs to store uh, everyone's data uh, locally in data centers, and you know, if I'm a government, I should be able to you know, go send my military there and be able to access whatever data I want um, and be able to take that for surveillance or military or, or helping um, you know, local um, military industrial companies. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I, I just think that that's a really bad future, right? That's not, that's not the direction that, um, that, that I, as, as, as you know, someone who's building one of these internet services or just as a citizen of the world, want to see the world going. Yeah, to be the devil's advocate for, for a moment, I mean, if I look at it from the viewpoint, let's say, of India. So I listened to the American president saying America first, and the in, I'm a nationalist, I'm not a globalist, I care about the interests of America, and I wonder, is it safe to store the data about Indian citizens in the US and not in India, when they're openly saying they care only about themselves? So why should it be in America and not in India? 
Well, I, I think that there's the, the motives matter. And you know, certainly, I, I don't think that that either of us would consider India to be an authoritarian country that mm -hmm. that has. So, so I, I, I would say that. Yeah, well, well, it, it can <laughs> still say yeah, uh, we want uh, data and metadata on Indian uh, users to be stored on Indian soil. We don't want it to be stored in on, on American soil or, or somewhere else. Yeah, and and I can understand the the arguments for that, and I, I think that there's the intent matters, right? And I think. Um, countries can come at this with um, with open values mm -hmm. and, and, and and still conclude that something like that could be helpful. But I think one of the things that you need to be very careful about is that if you set that precedent, you're making it very easy for other countries um, that don't have open values and that are mm -hmm. much more authoritarian and and want the data not to um, not to protect their citizens, but to be able to um, surveil them and, and find dissidents and, mm. and lock them up. Um, you know, that, uh, so I think... One uh, of the, one I, of the, I, I agree, you know, I mean, but, but I think that it, it really boils down to the questions that do we trust America? And given the past two, three years, people in more and more places around the world, I mean, previously, say if we were sitting here 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 40 years ago, then America declared itself to be the leader of the free world. We can argue a lot whether this was the case or not, or at least in, on, on, the, on, the, on the declaratory level, this was how America presented itself to the world. We are the leaders of the free world, so trust us, we care about freedom. But now we see a different America. America which doesn't want even to be, again, it's not a question of even what they do, but how America presents itself no longer as the leader of the free world, but as, as a country which is interested above all in itself and in its own interests. Um, and just this morning, for instance, I read that the US is considering uh, having a veto on the UN resolution against using sexual violence as a weapon of war. And the US is, is, is the one that thinks of veto vetoing this. And as somebody who is not a citizen of the US, I, I, I ask myself, can I still trust America to be the leader of the, of, of, of the free world if America itself says, I don't want this role anymore? Well. I think that that's a somewhat separate question from the the direction that the internet goes in, because I mean GDPR, the framework that that I, I'm advocating, that it would be better if more countries uh, adopted something like this, because I think that that's just significantly better than the alternatives, a lot of which are, are these more authoritarian models. Um, I mean GDPR originated in Europe, yeah. right? It, so that's, it's not an American mm -hmm. um, in, invention. Um, and I think in general, these, these values of um, openness in research, of, um, of, of cross-border flow of ideas and, um, and trade, mm -hmm. uh, that's not an American idea, right? I mean, that's, that's a global um, philosophy for mm -hmm. how the world should work. And I think that the alternatives to that are, at best, um, fragmentation, right, which breaks down the global model on this. Um, at worst, a growth in in authoritarianism mm -hmm. uh, for the models of how this gets gets adopted, and um, and that's where I think that the precedents on some of this stuff get really tricky. I mean, you can you, you're I think doing a good job of playing devil's advocate in the conversation <laughs> because you're 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 bringing all of the counter arguments that I think someone with good intent um, might bring to argue, hey, maybe um, maybe a different set of data policies is something that we should consider. The thing that I just worry about is that. What we've seen is that once a country um, puts that in place, that's a precedent that then a lot of other countries that might be more authoritarian use um, to, to basically be a precedent to argue that they should do the same things. And, and then that spreads. And, and I think that that's bad, right? And that's, that's one of the things that, um, that, that is, is the, the, the person running this company, um, I'm quite committed to making sure that we play our part um, and pushing back on that and keeping the internet as, as one platform. So, I mean, one of the most important decisions that I think I get to make as is, is the person running this company is where are we going to build our data centers and store, and store data? Mm -hmm. and, and we've made the decision that we're not going to put data centers in countries that we think have weak rule of law, um, that uh, where people's data may be improperly accessed um, and that could put people in harm's way. And, you know, I mean, a lot has been... 
There have been a lot of questions around the world around questions of, of censorship, and I, I think that those are really serious and important. I mean, I, uh, a lot of the reason why I, I, I build what we build is because I care about giving everyone a voice, giving people as much voice as possible. So I don't want people to be, to be censored. Um, at some level, these questions around data and how it's used and whether uh, authoritarian governments get access to it I think are even more sensitive because though, because if, if, if you can't say something that you want, um, that is, is highly problematic. Uh, that violates your, your human rights, I, I think, in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it stops progress. But, um, but if, if, if a government can get access to your data, then it can identify who you are and go lock you up. Um, and, and hurt you and hurt your family um, and cause real physical harm in ways that are just really deep. So I, I do think that, that, um, that people running these companies have an obligation um, to try to push back on that um, mm-hmm. and, and, and fight uh, establishing precedents which will be harmful, um, even if, if, if a lot of the initial countries that are, that are talking about some of this um, have good intent I think that this can easily go off the rails. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you talk about in the future um, AI and, and data, which are two concepts that are just really tied together, um, I, I just think the values that that comes from and whether it's part of a more global system, a more democratic process, a more open process, that's one of our best hopes for, for having this work out well. If, it's, mm-hmm. if it comes from um, repressive or authoritarian countries, then, um, then I, I just think that that's going to be highly problematic in a lot, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that raises the question of how do we how do we build AI in such a way that it's not inherently a tool of surveillance and manipulation and, and control I mean this goes back to the idea of creating something that knows you better than you know yourself which is kind of the the ultimate surveillance and control tool and we are building it now in, in, in different places around the world it, it, it's being built. And what are your thoughts about how to build an AI which serves individual people and protects individual people and not an AI which can easily, with a flip of a switch, becomes kind of the ultimate surveillance tool? Well, I think that that is more about the values and the policy framework than than the technological development. I mean, it's a lot of the research that's happening mm-hmm. in AI are just very fundamental m- mathematical methods um, where you know, a researcher will, will create an advance and now um, all of the neural networks will be 3% more efficient. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of throwing this out. Yeah. And, and that means that, all right, um, you know, newsfeed will be a little bit better for people. Um, our systems for detecting things like hate speech will be a little bit better. But it's it, you know our, our ability to um, to to find um, photos of you that you might want to review will be better. But but all these systems get get a little bit better. So now I think the the bigger question is you you have um, places in the world where governments are choosing to use that technology and those advances um, for things like widespread. Um, face recognition and surveillance. Mm-hmm. And th- those countries, I mean, China's doing this, um, and they create a real feedback loop which advances the state of that technology where you know, they say, okay, well, we want to do this. So now there's a set of companies that are sanctioned to, to go do that and are, have, are getting access to a lot of data to do it because it's, it's, it's allowed and encouraged. So, so that, that is advancing and getting better and better. It's not, that's not a mathematical process. That's, a, that's kind of a, a policy process that they want to go in that direction. Those are the, the values. Um, and it's an economic process of the feedback loop and development of those things compared to in countries that might say, hey, that kind of surveillance isn't what we want. Um, those companies just don't exist as much, right? Or, or, or don't get as much support. I don't know. In my home country of Israel is uh, at least... For Jews, it's a democracy, That's... and it's one of the leaders of the world in surveillance technology. And we basically have one of the biggest laboratories of surveillance technology in the world, which is the Occupied Territories. And exactly these kinds of systems yeah. are being developed there and exported all over the world. So again, given my personal experience back home, mm-hmm. again, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily trust that just because a society in its own inner workings is, say, democratic, that it will not develop and spread these kinds of, of technologies. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not clear that 
a democratic process alone solves it, but I do think that it is mostly a policy question, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, you know, a government can quite easily um, make the decision that they don't want to support that kind of surveillance, and then the companies that they would be working with to support that kind of surveillance would be out of business, mm -hmm. and and then, or, or at the very least, have much less economic incentive to continue the, that technological progress. So, so that dimension of of, of the growth of the technology um, gets stunted compared to others, and that's I mean, that's generally the process that I think um, you want to follow broadly. Right? It's, it, technological advance isn't by itself good or bad. I think it's the job of the people who are shepherding it, building it, and making policies around it to have policies and make sure that their effort goes towards amplifying the good and mitigating the negative use cases. And, and that's how I think you, you end up bending um, these industries and these technologies to be things that are, that are positive for humanity overall. And I think that that's a, a normal process that happens with most technologies that, um, that get built. But, but I think what we're seeing in some of these places is, is not the natural mitigation of negative uses. Um, in, in some cases, the economic feedback loop is, is pushing those things forward, mm -hmm. but I don't think it has to be that way. But I think that that's not as much a technological decision mm -hmm. as it is a policy decision. I, I fully agree, but I mean, it's, every technology can be used in, in different ways, uh, for good or for bad. You can, re you can use the radio to uh, broadcast music to people, mm -hmm. and you can use the radio to broadcast uh, Hitler giving a speech to millions of, of Germans. The radio doesn't care. The radio just carries whatever, uh, whatever you put in it. So yeah, it, it is a, a policy decision, but then it just raises the question, how do we make sure that the policies are the right policies in a world when it, it, it is becoming more and more easy to manipulate and mm. control people on a massive scale like, like never before. I mean, the new technology, mm. it's not just that we invented technology and then we have good democratic countries and bad authoritarian countries, and the question is what do they do with the technology? The technology itself mm -hmm. could change the balance of power between democratic and totalitarian systems. Yeah. And I fear that the new technologies are, are giving an inherent advantage, not necessarily overwhelming, but they, they do tend to give an inherent advantage to totalitarian regimes, because the, the biggest problem of totalitarian regimes in the 20th century, which eventually led to their downfall, is that they couldn't process the information efficiently enough. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Soviet Union, so you have this model, an, an information processing model, which basically says we take all the information from the entire country, uh, move it to one place, to Moscow, there it gets processed, decisions are made in one place, and, 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 and transmitted back as commands. This was the, the Soviet model of, in, of, of, of information processing. And versus the American version, which was, no, we don't have a single center. We have a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals and businesses, and they can make their own decisions. In the Soviet Union, the, 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 there is a, somebody in Moscow, uh, if I live on, in, in some small farm or, 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 or kolkhoz in Ukraine, there is somebody in Moscow who tells me how many radishes to grow this year, because they know. And in America, I decide for myself with, you know, I, I get signals from the market and I decide. And the Soviet model just didn't work well because of the difficulty of processing so much information quickly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, with, with 1950s technology. And this is one of the main reasons why the Soviet Union lost the Cold War to the United States. But with the new technology, it suddenly, it might become, I mean, it's not certain, but one of my fears is that the new technology suddenly makes central information processing far more efficient than mm -hmm. ever before and far more efficient than distributed data processing. Because the more data you have in one place, the better your algorithms and, and, and so on and so forth. And this kind of tilts the balance between totalitarianism and democracy in favor of totalitarianism. And I wonder what are your thoughts on, 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 on this issue? Well, I'm more optimistic about, <laughs> yeah, about, so. <laughs> about, uh, <laughs> about, about democracy in this. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, I think the way that the democratic process needs to work is people start talking about these problems, and then even if it seems like it starts slowly in terms of people caring about data issues and mm -hmm. technology policy, because um, it's a lot harder to get everyone to care about it than it is just a small number of decision makers. Mm -hmm. So I think that the history of democracy versus um, more totalitarian systems is it always seems like the totalitarian systems are going to be more efficient and the democracies are just going to get left behind. But you know, smart people, um, you know, people start discussing these issues and caring about them. And I do think we see um, that people do now care much more about their own privacy, um, about data issues, about the technology industry. Um, people are becoming more sophisticated about this. They realize that, um, that having uh, a lot of your data stored um, can both be an asset because it can help provide um, a, a lot of benefits and services to you, but increasingly maybe it's also a liability because mm -hmm. there are hackers and nation states who might be able to break in and use that data um, against you or, or exploit it or reveal it. Um, so maybe people don't want their, their data to be um, stored forever. Maybe they want it the, the, to be reduced in permanence. Maybe they, they want it all to be um, end to end encrypted as much as possible in their private communications. People really care about this stuff in a way that they they didn't before, and that's certainly over the last several years, mm -hmm. that's grown a lot. So I think that that conversation is the normal um, democratic process. And, and I think what's gonna end up happening is that by the time you get um, people broadly aware of the issues and on board, that is just a much more uh, powerful approach where then you do have um, people uh, in a decentralized system who are capable of making decisions um, who, who are smart. Um, who, who I think will generally always do it better than, um, than, than, than too centralized of an approach. And here is, a, again, a place where I worry that personifying AI and saying AI is a thing, right, that, that an institution will develop, and it's almost like a sentient being, um, I, I think mischaracterizes what mm -hmm. it actually is, right? It's, um, it's a set of methods that make everything better. Um, or like, sorry, that, sorry. Let me let me retract that. <laughs> that, that. That's way too broad. It's um, a lot of technological processes more efficient, and and I think that that's. Um, but 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 that's, but that's the worry. It, it but makes that's not also. For, but that's not just for centralized folks, right? It's. I mean, in in, in our context, you know, so we build uh, our, our business is this ad platform, mm -hmm. and a lot of the way that that can be used now is we have ninety million small businesses that use our tools. And now, because of this access to technology, um, they have access to the same tools uh, to do advertising and marketing and reach new customers and grow jobs that previously only the big companies would have had. And, um, and that's, um, that's a big advance, and that, that's, that's a massive decentralization. Um, when people talk about our company and, and the internet platforms overall, they talk about how there's a small number of companies that are big, and that's true, but the flip side of it is that now there are billions of people around the world who have a voice, um, that they can share information more broadly, and that's actually a massive decentralization in power um, and, and, and kind of returning power to people. Um, similarly, people have access to more information, have access to, to more commerce. That's, that's all positive. So I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist on this. I think we have real work cut out for us, and I think that the challenges that you raise are the right ones to be thinking about because if we get it wrong, um, that's the way in which I think it will go wrong. Um, but I, I don't know. I think that the historical precedent would say that at all points, you know, where there was um, the competition with between the U.S. and Japan in the 80s and the 70s or mm -hmm. the, the Cold War before that or different other times, people always thought that the democratic model, which is slow to mobilize, but, but um, the very strong once it does and once people get, get, get bought into a direction and understand the issue, um, I do think that that will continue to be um, the best way to spread prosperity around the world and make progress in a way that um, that that meets people's needs. And that's why, you know, when we're talking about internet policy, when you're talking about economic policy, I think spreading regulatory frameworks um, that encode those values, mm -hmm. um, I, I think, is one of the most important things that we can do. But it starts with raising the issues that you are and having people be aware of the potential problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that in the last few decades, uh, it was the case that open democratic systems were were better uh, and 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 more efficient. And this, I, I'm again, one of my fears is that it might have made us a bit complacent because we assume that this is kind of a law of nature, 
that distributed systems are mm -hmm. always better and more efficient mm -hmm. than centralized process uh, than centralized systems and we lived we grew up in a world in which there was kind of this to do the good thing morally was also to do the efficient thing economically and politically and a lot of countries liberalized their economy their society their politics over the last 50 years mm -hmm more because they were convinced of the efficiency argument than of the deep moral argument. And what happens if efficiency and morality suddenly split, which have happened before in history? I mean, the last 50 years are not representative of the whole of history. We had many cases before in human history in which repressive centralized systems were more efficient and therefore you got these repressive empires. And there is no law of nature which says that this cannot happen again. And again, my fear is that the new technology might tilt that balance. And just by making central, central data processing far more efficient, it could uh, uh, give a boost to totalitarian regimes. Also, in the balance of power between, say, again, the, the center and the individual, mm -hmm. that for most of history, the central authority could not really know you personally, simply because of, of, of the inability to, pro to gather and process the information. So there were some people who knew you very well, mm -hmm. but usually their interests were aligned with yours. Like my mother knows me very well, but most of the time I can trust my mother. But um, now we are reaching a point when some system far away can know me better than my mother and the interests are not necessarily aligned. Now, yes, we can use that also for good, but what I'm pointing out that this is a kind of power that never existed before and it could empower totalitarian and authoritarian regimes to do things that was simply technically impossible mm -hmm. uh, until today. Yeah. And, the, and, you know, if, 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 if you live in, a, in an open democracy, so okay, you can rely on all kinds of mechanisms to protect yourself. But thinking more globally about this issue, I think the, a key question is how do you protect human attention from being hijacked by malevolent players who know you better than you know yourself, who know you better than your, your mother knows you? And this is a question that we never had to face before, mm -hmm. because we never had, usually the malevolent players just didn't know me very well. Yeah, okay, so th there's a lot in, in what you were <laughs> yeah. just talking about. I mean, I think, um, in, in general, one of the things that, I do think that there is a scale effect where um, one of the best things that we could do to, to if, if we care about these open values and having a, a globally connected um, world, I think making sure that the critical mass of the investment in new technologies encodes those values um, is really important. So that's one of the reasons why I care a lot about not, um, not supporting the spread of, of authoritarian um, policies um, to more countries and either inadvertently doing that um, or setting precedents that, that enable that to happen. Because I think the more development that happens um, in the way that is more open, where the research is more open, where, um, where people have the, uh, the, the, where the policy making around it is, is more democratic, I think that that's going to be positive. So I, I think kind of maintaining that balance um, ends up being really important. Um, and one of the reasons why I think democratic countries over time tend to do better on, on serving what people want is because there's no metric to optimize the society, right? It's like a, when you talk about efficiency, a lot of what people are talking about is economic efficiency, yeah. right? Am I, are we increasing GDP? Are we increasing um, jobs? Are we decreasing poverty? And those things are all good. But I think part of what the democratic process does is people get to decide on their own um, which of the dimensions in society matter the most to them but if in you their can, lives. If you, can manipul if you can hijack people's attention and manipulate See, them, then people deciding on their own just doesn't help because I don't realize it. Somebody manipulated me to think that this is what I want. If, um, and, and we are reaching the point 
when for the first time in history you can do that on a massive scale. So again, I, I speak a lot about the issue of free will in, in this mm. regard. And the yeah. people that are easiest to manipulate are the people who believe in free will and who simply identify with whatever thought or desire pops up in their mind because they cannot even imagine mm -hmm. that this desire is not the result of my free will, this desire is the result of some external manipulation. Now it may sound paranoid, and for most of history it was probably paranoid because nobody had this kind of ability to do it on a, on a massive scale, but yeah. Here, like in, in Silicon Valley, the tools to do that on a massive scale have been developed over the last few decades. And they may have been developed with the best intentions. Some of them may have been developed with the intention of just selling stuff to people and selling products to people. But now the same tools that can be used to sell me something I don't really need mm -hmm. can now be used to sell me a politician I really don't need or an ideology that I really don't need. It's the same tool, it's the same hacking the human animal and manipulating what's happening inside. Yeah, okay, so there's, there's, a, lot, there, there's a lot going on here. I think that there's, mm -hmm. when designing these systems, I think that there's the intrinsic design, which you wanna make sure that you get right, and then there's preventing abuse, which yeah. I think is something that there's, there's two types of questions that people raise. I mean, one is, you know, we saw what the, you know, Russian government tried to do in the 2016 election. That is, um, that's clear abuse. We need to build up um, really advanced systems uh, for detecting that kind of interference um, in, in the democratic process and, and more broadly, um, being able to identify that, identify when, you know, people are standing up networks of, of fake accounts um, that are not behaving in a way that normal people would, um, to be able to weed those out and, and work with mm -hmm. law enforcement and election commissions and folks all around the world and intelligence community to be able to coordinate and be able to deal with that effectively. So stopping abuse is certainly important. But I would argue that the even more, uh, the deeper question is about the intrinsic design of the systems, yeah, right? Exactly. So not, not, not just fighting the abuse. And there, um, I, think that, I, I think that the incentives are more aligned towards a good outcome mm -hmm. than a lot of um, critics might say. And here's why. I think that there's a difference between what people want first order and what they want um, you know, second order over time, right? It's, so right now you might um, just consume a video because you think it's silly or, or fun and mm -hmm. you, know, you, you wake up and or, or you 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 kind of look up an, an hour later and you've you've watched a bunch of videos and you're like well what happened to my my time <laughs> and it, okay so maybe in the narrow short term period you um you you consumed some more content mm -hmm. um and and maybe you saw some more ads so it seems like it's good for the business but it actually really isn't over time because people make decisions based on what um, they find valuable mm -hmm. and um, what we find at least in in our work is that what people really want to do is connect with other people, right? It's, it's not just passively consume content. Um, it's, so we've had to find and constantly adjust our systems over time um, to make sure that, that we're rebalancing it so that way you're interacting um, with people, so that way we, we make sure that we don't just measure systems in, this, in the uh, signals in the system, like what are you clicking on, because mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that could get you into a, a bad local optimum. Yeah. Um, but instead we bring in real people to tell us what their real experience is in words, mm -hmm. right? Not, not just kind of filling out uh, scores, but also telling us, you know, what, where, what, what were the most meaningful experiences you had today? What, um, what content was the most important? What interaction did you have with a friend that mattered to you the most? And was that connected to something that we did? And, and, and if not, then, then we go and try to do the work to figure out how we can facilitate that. Um, and what we find is that yeah, in the near term, maybe showing some people some, some more viral videos might increase time, right? But over the long term, it doesn't. Um, it's not actually aligned with, with, um, with our business interest or the long-term social interest. So in, in, in kind of in, in strategy terms, that would be a stupid thing to do. And um, now I think a lot of people think that businesses are just very short-term oriented and that we only care about, uh, people think that businesses only care about the next you know, quarter profit. Um, but, but I think that most businesses that, that, that get run well, that's just not the case. And you know, I, I think last year on one of our earnings calls, um, you know, I told investors that we'd actually reduce the amount of video watching that quarter 
by 50 million hours a day because we wanted to take down the amount of, of viral videos that people were seeing because we thought that that was displacing more meaningful interactions that people were having with other people, which in the near term might have a short-term impact on the business for that quarter, but, um, but over the long term uh, would be more positive, both for um, how people feel about the products and for the business. And you know, one of the patterns that I think has actually been quite um, inspiring or, or a cause of optimism in running a business is that oftentimes you make decisions that you think are going to pay off long down the road, right? So you, you think, okay, I'm doing the right thing long term, but it's going to hurt for a while. Mm-hmm. And I, I almost always find that the long term comes sooner than you think. Mm. And, um, and, and that when you make these decisions that they're maybe taking some pain in the near term um, in order to get to what will be a better case down the line, um, that better case, maybe you think it'll take five years, but, but actually it ends up coming in, in you know, a year. Right, and um, I think people at some deep level know when something is good, uh, and 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 like, and and I guess this gets back to the democratic values because it, uh, at some level I, I trust that people have a sense of what they actually care about, and it may be that you know if we were showing uh, more viral videos, maybe that would be better than the alternatives that they have to do right now, right? I mean, maybe that's better than what's on TV because at least they're personalized videos. Um, you know, maybe it's better than. Than YouTube, if we're, we have better content or, or whatever the reason is, but um, but I think you could still make the service better over time um, for actually matching what people want. And if you do that, that is going to be better for everyone. So I, I do think the intrinsic design of these systems is quite aligned with with, with serving people in a way that is um, pro social, and and that's certainly what I care about. And running this company is to to get there. Yeah, I think this is like the the, the rock bottom. That this is the most important issue. That Ultimately, what I'm hearing from you and from many other people when I have these discussions is ultimately the customer is always right, the voter knows best, people know deep down, people know what is good for them, people make a choice, if they choose to do it, then it's good. That's the, that's, and and that's, that has been the bedrock of at least you know, Western democracies for, for centuries, for generations. And this is now where the, 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 the big question mark is. Is it still true in a world where we have the technology to hack human beings and manipulate them like never before, that the customer is always right, that the voter knows best? Or um, have we gone past this point? And we can know, I mean, and, and, the, and the, the simple ultimate answer that, well, this is what people want and, and, and they know what's good for them, maybe it's no longer the case. Well, yeah, I think that the, it's, it's not clear to me that that has changed, but I think that that's, that's a, a, a very deep question yeah, about democracy. This is the I don't think that that's a new question. I mean, I think it's people have always. No, the question this, isn't new. The technology is new. I mean, if you lived in 19th century America, and you didn't have these extremely powerful tools to decipher and influence people, well, well, then me, it was a different. Well, let me actually frame this a different way. Okay. Which is, I actually think, you know, for all the talk around, is democracy being hurt by, um, by the the current set of tools and, and the media and, 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 mm-hmm. and all this. Um, I actually think that there's an argument that the world is significantly more democratic now than it was in the past. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the country was set up as, um, the U.S. was set up as a republic, right? So um, a lot of the, the foundational rules um, limited the power of, of a lot of individuals um, mm-hmm. being able to vote and have a voice and checked um, the popular will at a lot of different stages, everything from the way that laws get written by Congress, right, and not by by people, mm-hmm. um, you know, so the, to, to everything to the electoral college, and which which a lot of people um, think today is, is is undemocratic, but I mean, but it was put in place because of of, um, of of a set of values that that a democratic republic would be better. I actually think what has happened today is that increasingly more people are enfranchised and mm-hmm. more people have a voice. Um, more people have had, are getting the vote, um, but but increasingly people have a voice. More people have access to information, um, and I think a lot of what people are, are asking is is that good? 
It's, it's not necessarily the question of, okay, the democratic process has been the same, um, but now the technology is different. I think the technology has made it so individuals are more empowered, and part of the question is, is, is that the world that we want? And I, I again, this is an area where it's it's not that I mean all of these things are with challenges right and and um and often progress causes a lot of issues and it's it's a really hard thing to reason through um, wow we're trying to make progress and, and and help all these people join the the, the global economy or um, you know help people join the communities and have have the the social lives that they would want and be accepted in different ways um, but it comes with this dislocation in the near term and that's a massive dislocation so that seems really painful. Um, but but I actually think that you can make a case that we are at and, 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 continue, and continue to be at um, the most democratic time. And I think that um, overall, in the history of our country at least, when we've gotten more people to have the vote and we've gotten more representation and, um, and we've made it so people have access to more information and more people can share their experiences, I do think that that's made the country stronger and has um, and, and has helped progress. And it, it's not that this stuff is without is, is without issues. It, it has massive issues. But um, that's at least the pattern that I see and why I'm optimistic about well, I, about, I, about a lot of the work. I agree that more people have more voice than ever before, both in the U.S. and globally. That's I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. My concern is to what extent we can trust the voice. Of, of people, to, to what extent I can trust my voice. Like I'm, we have this picture of the world that I have this voice inside me which tells me what is right and what is wrong. And the more I'm able to express this voice in the outside world and influence what's happening and the more people can express their voices, it's, it's better, it's more democratic. But what happens if at the same time that more people can express their voices, it's also easier to manipulate your inner voice to what extent you can really trust that the thought that just pop up, popped up in your mind is the result of some free will and not the result of an extremely uh, uh, powerful algorithm that understands what's happening inside you and knows how to push the buttons and press the levers and is serving some external entity. And it has planted this thought or this desire that you now express. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's two different issues of giving people voice and trusting. And again, I'm not saying I know everything, but all these, these people that now join the conversation, we cannot trust their voices. Mm -hmm. I'm asking this about myself, to what extent I can trust my own inner voice. And, you know, I, I spend two hours meditating every day. And I go on these long meditation retreats. Mm -hmm. And my main takeaway from that is it's craziness inside there. And it's so complicated. And the, 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 the simple naive belief that the thought that pops up in my mind, this is my free will, this, is, this was never the case. But if, say, a thousand years ago, the battles inside were mostly between, you know, neurons and biochemicals and childhood memories and, and, and all that, increasingly, you have external actors going under your skin and into, into your brain and into your mind. And how do I trust that my amygdala is not a Russian agent now? How do I know? The more we understand about the extremely complex world inside us, the less easy it is to simply trust what this inner voice is, is, is telling, is saying. Yeah, I, I understand the, the point that you're making. As one of the people who's running a company that develops ranking systems to try to help show people content that's going to be interested mm -hmm. to them. Um, I there's a dissonance between the way that you're explaining what you think is possible mm -hmm. and what I see as a, as a as, as a practitioner building this. Mm -hmm. I think you can build systems that can get good at, at, at a very specific thing, right, at, at helping to, um, you know, understand which of your friends you care the most about so you can rank their content mm. higher in newsfeed. But the idea that there's some kind of generalized um, AI that's a monolithic thing that understands all dimensions of, 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 of who you are 
um, in, in a way that's that's deeper than you do, um, I think doesn't exist and is probably quite far off from existing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's certainly abuse of the systems that I think needs to be um, that, that, I, that I think is more of a policy and values question, which is, you know, on, on Facebook, you know, you're supposed to be your, your real identity. So if you have, um, you know, to use your example, um, Russian agents or folks from the, the, the government, um, the IRA, who are posing as someone else and, and saying something, mm-hmm. um, and you see that content, but you think it's coming from someone else, then that's not an algorithm I- issue. I mean, that's um, that's someone abusing the system and taking advantage of the fact that you trust that on 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 this platform, um, someone is generally going to be who they say they are. So you can trust that the information is coming from someplace and and kind of slipping in the back door that way. And that's the thing that we certainly need to go fight. Um, but I, I don't know. As, as a broad as as a broad matter, I do think that there's this question of um, you know, to what degree are the systems, and this kind of brings it full circle to where we started on, Mm -hmm. on is it fragmentation or is it personalization? Um, Is, you know, is is the content that you see, um, if it resonates, is that because it actually just more matches your interests? Or is it because you're being incepted and convinced of something that you don't actually believe and doesn't and is dissonant with your your interests and your beliefs and certainly all the psychological research that 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 I that I've seen and and the experience that that we've had is that when people see things that don't match um, what what they believe they just ignore it mm-hmm. right so um, so certainly there's there's a um, there can be an evolution that happens where you know a system shows. Um, information that you're going to be interested in, and, um, and if that's not managed well, um, that can uh, that has the risk of pushing you down a path towards um, adopting a more extreme position or mm-hmm. evolving the way you think about it over time. Uh, but but I think most of the the content it resonates with people because it resonates with their lived experience, and to the extent that people are abusing that. Um, and, and either trying to represent that there's someone who they're not or trying to um, take advantage of a bug in, in human psychology where mm-hmm. we might be more prone to, to, to an, an extremist idea. That's our job in, in either policing the platform, working with governments and, 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 um, and different agencies, um, and making sure that we design our systems and our recommendation systems to, to not uh, be promoting things that people might engage with in the near term, but over the long term will regret and resent us for, for having done that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's in our interest to get that right. And, um, and, and for a while, I think we didn't understand the depth of some of the problems and challenges that we face there. Um, and there's certainly still a lot more to do. And when you're up against nation states, I mean, they're very sophisticated. Mm-hmm. So they're going to keep on evolving their tactics. But, um, but the thing that I would, that I think is really important is that the fundamental design of the systems, I do think, and our incentives are aligned um, with, with helping people um, connect with the people they want, have meaningful interactions, not just getting people to, to watch a bunch of content that they're going to resent later that they did that, um, and, and certainly not making people have, have more extreme or negative viewpoints um, than, than, than what they actually believe. Mm-hmm. So uh, Maybe I can try and, and, and summarize my, my view on that. We have two distinct dangers coming out of the same technological tools. Uh, we have the, the easier danger to grasp, which is of extreme totalitarian regimes of a kind we haven't seen before. And this could happen in, in different countries, maybe not in the US, but in, in other countries, that these tools, uh, you say that, they, they, I mean, that uh, these are abuses, but in some countries, this could become the norm that you are living from the moment you are born in this system that constantly monitors and surveils you and constantly kind of manipulates you from, from a very early age to adopt particular ideas, views, habits, so forth, in a way which was never possible before. Mm-hmm. And this is like the full-fledged totalitarian dystopia, um, which could be so effective that people would not even resent it <laughs> because it, they will be completely aligned with, uh, uh, with the, the values or, or, or the ideals of, of the system. It's not 1984 where you need to torture people all the time. No, if you have agents inside their brain, you don't need the external secret police. 
So that's, that's one danger. It's like the, 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 the full-fledged totalitarianism. Then in places like the US, the more immediate danger or, or problem to think about is what is increasingly people refer to as surveillance capitalism that you have these systems that constantly interact with you and, and come to, to know you, and it's all supposedly in your best interests to give you better recommendations and better advice. So it starts with recommendation for which movie to, to watch and, and where well to go on vacation. But as the system becomes better, it gives you a recommendation on what to study at college. Uh, where to work, ultimately whom to marry, mm -hmm. who to vote for, which religion to join, like join a community. Like you have all these religious communities, this is the best religion for you. For your type of personality, Judaism, nah, it, it won't work for you, go with Zen Buddhism. It's, it's, much, it's a much better fit for your personality. You would thank us in five years, you would look back and you say, this was an amazing recommendation, thank you. I so, so much enjoy Zen Buddhism. And again, People will, it will feel that this is aligned with their own best interests. And, and the system improves over time. Yeah, there will be glitches. Not everybody will be happy all the time. But what does it mean that all the most important decisions in my life are being taken by an external algorithm? What does it mean in terms of human agency, in terms of, you know, the, the meaning of life? You know, mm -hmm. for, for thousands of years, humans tended to view life as a drama of decision-making. Like life is your it's a journey, you reach an intersection after intersection, and you need to choose. Some decisions are small, like what to eat for breakfast, and some decisions are really big, like who, whom to marry. And all of, almost all of art and all of religion is about that. Like almost every, whether it's a Shakespeare tragedy or a Hollywood comedy, it's about the hero or heroine needing to make a big decision, to, to be or not to be, to marry X or to marry Y. And what does it mean to live in a world in which increasingly we rely on the recommendations of algorithms to make these decisions until we reach a point when we simply follow them all the time or most of the time? And they make good recommendations. I'm not saying that this is some abuse, some, some something sinister. No, it's, they're good recommendations. But I'm just, we don't have a model for understanding what is the meaning of human life in such a situation. Well, I think the biggest objection that I'd have to, to both of the th ideas that you just raised is that we have access to a lot of different sources of, of information, a lot of people to talk to about different things. And it's not just like there's one set of recommendations or, or a single recommendation that gets to dominate um, what we do and that, that gets to be overwhelming, either in the totalitarian or the, um, the capitalist model of what you were, what mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, to the contrary, I think people really don't like um, and are very distrustful when they feel like they're being told what to do or just have a single option. One of the big questions that we've studied um, is how to address um, you know, when there's a hoax or, or clear misinformation. And the most obvious thing that, um, that it would seem like you'd, you'd do intuitively is, is tell people, hey, this seems like it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Here is the other point of view um, that, uh, that, that, that is right. Um, or, or, or at least, you know, if it's a polarized thing, even if it's not clear what's, what's wrong and what's right, it's, here's the other point of view, um, you know, if you're on, on, on any given issue. Um, and that really doesn't work, right? So, so what ends up happening is if you tell people that something is false, but they believe it, then they just end up not trusting you, yeah. right? So, so that, that ends up not working. And if you frame two things as opposites, right? So if you say, okay, well, you're a person who doesn't believe in, you're seeing content that, about not believing in, in climate change. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to show you the other perspective, right? Here's something that argues that climate change is a thing. Um, that actually just entrenches you further mm -hmm. um, because it's, okay, someone's trying to kind of control. Yeah, and, okay, so, so what ends up working? Right, sociologically and, and psychologically, the thing that, that ends up actually being effective is giving people um, a range of choices. So if you show not, here's the other opinion and, and with a judgment on, on, the, on the piece of content that a person engaged with, but instead you show a series of related articles right, or content. 
then people can kind of work out for themselves, hey, here's the range of different opinions or, or things that, um, that exist on this topic. And you know, maybe I lean in one direction or the other, but I'm kind of going to work out for myself where I want to be. Um, most people don't choose the most extreme thing. Um, and, um, and people end up feeling like they're informed and can, can make a good decision. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, I think that that's the, the architecture and the responsibility that we have is to make sure that the work that we're doing um, gives people more choices, that it's not a given uh, single opinion um, that can kind of dominate anyone's thinking, mm-hmm. um, but where you can you know, connect to hundreds of different friends. And even if most of your friends share your religion or your political ideology, um, you're probably going to have 5 or 10% of friends who come from a different background, who have different ideas, and at least that's getting in as well. So you're, you're getting a broader range of, um, of, of views. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that these are really important questions, and it's not like there's, there's an answer um, that, that is going to um, you know, fully solve it one way, one way or another. Definitely but, not. But I think <laughs> these are the right things to, to talk through. Um, you know, we've been going for 90 minutes, so, yeah. so we probably should <laughs> uh, wrap up. Uh, but, uh, but I think we, we have a lot of material to, to cover in, in the next one of these that hopefully yeah. we'll get to do um, at some point in the future. And, um, thank you so much for, for coming and joining and doing this. This has been a, a really interesting uh, series of important topics to, to, to discuss. Yeah, so thank, me for, th- thank you for hosting me and uh, for you know, being open about these very difficult questions, which I know that you, know, you being the, the head of, of, the, of a global corporation, I can just sit here and, and speak whatever I want, <laughs> but you have many more responsibilities on your head, so I appreciate that, that kind of you putting yourself on, on the firing line and, and dealing with, with these questions. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Yeah.